Father, thank you for your word, for your word is life. Your word says that in the Old Testament, everything was given to us that we might learn, that we might point, that we might understand everything that you're doing and everything that the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, Messiah Nagid, said he would accomplish. He is the Lord our God. May we see him in every page and may we experience him in every step we take in life. And God, in the victories and the defeats, in the mountaintops and in the valleys, may you teach us your word. And, and, and for that person here that's looking for a word of confirmation, may you confirm. For that person that's here that's looking for a word of instruction, somebody here needs a rhema word. I just I sense it deep in my spirit that somebody's needing your word to fall upon them, a promise to hold on to. Thank you, God, that your word says that the field will fade, the grass will die, but the word of our God stands forever. Stand forever in our life and begin tonight if need be. In Christ Jesus, amen. Amen. If you were here the last week, we looked at Elkanah, or Elkanah, however you want to pronounce it, and he had two wives, and Elkanah had a wife named Hannah. And Hannah was barren. For many years, she wanted to have kids so bad and couldn't. And she went to the church and she prayed to God. And if you guys remember, her lips were moving and her heart was stirring, but there was nothing coming out of her mouth. And, and the priest looked at her and said, Hey, you drunken woman, why you put your wine away? And she didn't find indignation in that. She didn't find that a reason to be mad and stomp away and go, That's why I don't go to church. She said, no, my Lord, I'm a woman of bitter heart, and I'm pouring out everything to God. And who knows if Eli was shamed or not shamed. I don't know. It doesn't say he was repentant or anything like that. But Eli said, go your way, and may all your prayers come to pass. And so faithful is our God. And her prayer was, God, if you would give me a child, I'll give him right back to you. If you give me a child... I won't even hold on to him. It almost sounds like she's bargaining with God. It almost sounds like she's making a deal with God. But I guess in some strange way, all prayer is kind of like that. God, if you'll bless me, I'll bless you right back. And I think a lot of people, especially of Catholic persuasion, my father used to always say that to me, being Catholic, they always feel like they shouldn't ask God nothing for themselves. Jews are like that too. Uh, what do they call it? A mitzvah or something? Is that mitzvah? Mitzvah. My mom, who's Jewish, used to always say, don't ask for nothing for yourself. I think the heart of God is missed in that, guys. Understand that Hannah came to God and said, if you do this for me, I will give you back my son to serve you all the days of his life. And God said, but don't you know I want this for you. I love in the New Testament, God's word says, it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We sit here with this burden on ourselves, telling ourselves, God's punishing me. That's why I don't have a job. That's why I lost my fight. That's why I lost my husband. That's why this happened. No. No. In order to get a diamond, you take a piece of coal and you put pressure on it. And after a few thousand years, you have a diamond. God says, you're my diamond. And there's only 70, maybe 80 years you're going to be on this earth, and I'm going to put some pressure on you. Well, that's not what I heard. I heard in this other church that God has to bless you. I heard in this other place, God owes it to you. I heard in this other place, if you're not blessed... If you do lose, if you don't have, you don't have enough faith. How nice. But that's not the Bible. And that's not the heart of God. I always go back to my own attitude toward my children. I always do that because even though the Lord Jesus said, if you, being evil, know to have good gifts, give good gifts to your kids, how much more will God give you the Holy Spirit when you ask? And I always, so I always use that, and I always go back and say, man, you know, it's a funny thing. My son, he wants, he's 15, and he wants to stay up till 3 o'clock in the morning playing video games. 
and he really deserves it. I mean, the kid gets up in the morning, he does his homeschool, he drives his bike to the gym, you know, he helps out around the house or whenever he counts. Buddy, I'd love to let you stay up till four o'clock in the morning and play video games, but it's no way gonna happen. Go to bed. Oh, but I, I, I don't wanna hear you whining. Go to bed. But I could always smash the computer to smithereens, that's your other option. And he goes to bed and it's like, man, I feel kid works so hard, you know? And I know that's the heart of God. But I really like that guy. But he was so cute. God said, oh, he's going to be terrible for you. Oh, believe me. But I, I really wanted him. That's the job, God. I knew it. As soon as I saw it, it's just... It was my connection, 75000 a year, God, that's the job. God said, no, it's not. I got a job that pays 50, but that 50 will go further than the 70. That makes no sense, humanly sense. But in heaven, it makes perfect sense. Scripture in the Bible. Now, why am I talking so much about this? You'll get there, Relax. There's a scripture in the Bible that says that the Jews, at one point, the Hebrews, would put money in their pocket, and they'd go to get it later and go, hey, where'd it go? I, didn't I just put it in there? He said, when I don't bless your money, you can put it in your pocket. It'll be gone by the time you reach back in. Bringing us to Eli. The attention is turned now from Elkanah and his wives and kids Last thing we looked at last week was how Hannah not only promised God, but man, she delivered. Now that's strength. Because the vast majority of the people, they come to the Lord and they go, God, if you'll do this for me, I'll do this for you. You, know? you guys remember I talk about that movie all the time, The End? You guys remember we talk about The End? This movie in the 80s called The End. I think it was the early 80s, it might even be the late 70s. Uh, it was Dom DeLuise and Burt Reynolds. Uh, Burt Reynolds had this disease, he was going to die, but he didn't want to wait till he died, he was going to commit suicide. And at the end of the movie, he said, that's it, I'm doing, he swims out. He goes out, he's, he's a good hundred yards out, and he just dives straight down. And in, in the movie, you know how movies are weird, you see the depths of the ocean, and in his ears, he starts hearing his daughter talking, and his parents, why would he do such a thing, you know, the thing, and, and, and then all of a sudden, you hear him go, I want to live! I want to live. And he swims to the top. Oh, oh, but he looks and he's so wiped out, tired. And he says, God, if you help me live, I promise 80% of everything I, I have. Will, you're, and he's, he's swimming and he's sinking down, but he's getting closer to the, and he's, he's like, oh my goodness. He looks like he's 50. I was like, God, I swear 50%. It's yours. <laughs> he gets to the shore and he washes him. And he makes it to the shore. And he goes, God, that, that 10%'s yours, man. Hannah wasn't like that. Hannah had her child, and she didn't know she was ever going to have another child. But she made a promise, man, and she was going to do it. Whew. Almost reminds you of that whole thing with, uh, with Abraham and Isaac, where Abraham went on the mountain and sacrificed his son. He said, no, I'm going to do this. God said, well, he believed. The Bible says that because he, he believed that God was able to raise his son up even if he did sacrifice him. You guys might not know the story, and if you don't, I shouldn't make you curious about the things of the Lord, and you can look in the book of Genesis for that later on. However, verse 12, as our attention turns from Elkanah and his family to Eli and his family, verse 12, now the sons of Eli were corrupt, and they did not know God. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand, I love that word, by the way. That's a manly word, a flesh hook. The three-pronged flesh hook. I said to my wife the other day, I said, baby, what's missing? She said, what? She served me dinner. Is miss something missing? What? A three-pronged flesh hook. <laughs> get up and get your own fork, woman. Man. Three-pronged flesh hook in his hand. That's a make-believe story, by the way. It didn't happen. I just, just throwing that in. 
while the meat was boiling. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself all that the flesh had brought up. So they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Please give me your attention. Let me explain to you exactly what's going on. They had set up the tabernacle in a city called Shiloh. According to the book of Leviticus, the book of Numbers, when the Israelites, when the Jews had got rescued, got delivered, got set free from their bondage of slavery from Egypt, God had delivered to them the law of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Here was the book of the law. And if you wanted to live in a, what's called a theocracy, a commune governed by God, these are the ways to please God. And whenever you broke one of those laws, whenever you broke one of those commandments, oh, I messed up again. But don't worry, there's atonement. You would get a lamb out of your flock. You'd bring it to the priest. You'd set it down there. You'd put your hand on it. The priest would, would cut the thing's throat. It would die. They'd take the flesh. They'd put it in a pot of water, and they'd boil it. He'd take the three-pronged flesh hook. He'd pull out. The priest's job was to prepare, to boil. He was to make the sacrifice for you. There was a priest who sat in what's called... The word just left me. Help me. No, no. He sat in intercession. Thank you. Intercession. That reminded me, though. For us. That is why, just going forward now 5,000 years, when... It was proclaimed by the Jew, John the Baptist. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Finally, the last sacrifice was about to be made. John had proclaimed it. This had gone on for thousands of years. And they'd go to Shiloh, they'd go to the tabernacle, and they'd bring the meat to the priest, and the priest would throw it into the boiling water. This is what was going on. So this was normal things. You understand what I'm saying, right? The priest would come and say, uh, verse... 14, I'll go to 14 again. Then he would thrust into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself all that the flesh hook brought up. So they did in Shiloh, all the Israelites who came there. Now, to be a priest, guys, I forgot this, to be a priest came with a lot of responsibility, but it also came with a lot of blessings. The responsibility was you had to take care of the temple. You did not get paid. You had to make sure that the people were well taken care of. You had to take their sacrifices, clean their sacrifice, keep the altar, keep the fire burning in the temple. But all the meat that came in, all the sacrifices, whatever was left over was yours. You follow me? Being a priest wasn't a bad deal if you like to eat. Verse 15, also, before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who sacrificed, Give me meat for roasting to the priest, for he will not take boiled meat from you, but raw. And if a man said to him they should really burn the fat first, then you may take as much as your heart desires, he would then answer him, No, but you must give it now. If not, I will take it by force. Please give me your attention again. Here's what happened. These two kids of Eli's, they decided it wasn't enough just to them to have the meat to eat. They said, hey, uh, we're not going to take that one raw. Now, I'm, putting, uh, I'm, I'm assuming the reason they were doing that is because then they could cut it up and they could take it to the market and sell it. Or they could sell it out the back door of the, of the temple. That would be logical. And, and if somebody said to them, hey, listen, no, 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 no. According to Scripture, according to Levitical law, you got to boil that first. And they said, listen, you got two choices. You give me the meat, or I take it. Could you imagine somebody in the temple, in the house of God, commanding them to give them a sacrifice? Whoa, 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 I came here to have my burdens released. And you're... Th horrible thing. Verse um, 17. Therefore the sin of the young man was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Now, I'm going to stop here for a second. You're going to read that God wanted to kill these two men. Later on in the same section, it says that they didn't heed the voice of the Lord nor the voice of their father because God wanted to kill them. What did these men do 
that had caused God to want to kill them. Listen, I don't mean to pick on churches every single week because it's not my thing, but if we're at a section of scripture that specifically enumerates it, there are some churches where they'll pass a bucket around. Hey, come on, come on. One deacon on one side, one the other, pass the thing. I didn't see you put your tithe in. I've, I've seen you do that a lot. Did you, did you put your tithe in? Make sure she puts her tithe in. Count, I want you to count her checks. Make sure this one. If not, it's the other way around. Wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. Wait a sec. Spirit's leading me to... No, no, it's over here somewhere. With the ring on the finger. No. You. The Spirit's told me that if you will give him an offering tonight of $1,000, he will return tenfold in the coming months. That's not me. That's the Lord has done that. Some churches you go there, and the first thing that happens is the band's playing, and everybody goes forward, and they give their offering. And the guys come around there, and everybody comes to the offering. And then halfway through the service is another offering. Get some money right now. That's not money. <laughs> and then when you leave, another offering. People don't want to go to the church anymore. Matter of fact, you can Google this or YouTube it, whatever. There's a new show coming out all about pastors that are wealthy, super wealthy. And the guy that's on the, on the, on the beginning of the, the uh, what do you call it, the coming attraction, what do you call that, the teaser reel or whatever it is, he says, I was thinking, why should Jay-Z, why should all, any names, some rock stars, rap stars, whatever, say, why should they be the only ones driving the Ferraris and living in the big houses and having to bling bling? Bible says that God wants to prosper me. This is my idea of prosperity. And you watch it and it just, oh my goodness. It sickens you. But it's okay, because 15 minutes later, you'll see him praying over somebody. In the name of Jesus, I bless. And you know, oh, I guess he's not such a bad guy after all. He prays. Listen, see, I want you to see this. Therefore, the sin of the young man was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. You ask me why we do things at Calvary Chapel, Deerfield Beach, there's a box on the wall. If you want to give, give. If you don't, that's between you and God. I'll even give you the promises of God. The Bible says that if you will give, God will open up a window of blessing so great you can't contain it. I will tell you that the Bible even says in Malachi chapter 3 that you rob God by not giving 10%. I will give you the ups and the downs, but I will not encourage you, coerce you. I will not get you to give anything but willingly with a cheerful heart. For God, the Bible says, loves a cheerful giver. And that word cheerful literally means hilarious. <laughs> uh, I don't have the money, but here you go, God. Shame. Shame on the because I can't separate myself from these men. And I don't look at them and point my finger, oh, these guys. This pastor. And you... mm. But Samuel, verse 18, ministered before the Lord, even as a child wearing a linen ephod. Now, an ephod was a type of vest. Now, what would happen was, uh, moreover, verse 19, look, his mother used to make him a little robe. I love the way they did a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer yearly sacrifice. Now, there was three, there was like eight or nine um, feasts a year for the Jew. And the, Jew, Jew, the, the true Jew would make his pilgrimage from wherever he was at this time to Shiloh. And then later on, the tabernacle was moved until it eventually settled in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem became the epicenter, the, the, the center of, of all the world's uh, faithful. But the Jews would go up there, and we talked about how they would sing the songs, the songs of ascent from the book of Psalms. They would have to go to three a year. 
So you figure, let's say for argument's sake, that three times a year she went up and she made that to see her son. Let's say he was weaned at five and she, she left him there for, and she, every time she'd come, every three or four, she'd bring him new clothes and he'd have a little robe. Imagine the robes that a priest wore with a little vest and there he's here, there's little Samuel, his little robe and little vest. This is cute to me. It's just, it's just the way they she'd bring him a little robe. She made a little robe for him. A little ephod, a little vest. Verse 20, and Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, The Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. Then they would go to their own home. And the Lord visited Hannah that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Did you hear that? She gave God one. He gave her back five. Sounds like 10% to me. Isn't God faithful? She gave him a child. She gave God her child. Now, let's continue. Verse 22, Now Eli was very old and heard everything his sons did to all Israel and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. So he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. Give me your attention. I'm going to stop and just... It says they used to lay with the women. who The women came burdened with sin. Come here, my daughter. Let's talk about it. Women who come to church burdened with sin. Why, some of you guys, well, nobody here, but some people ask me why I've been so difficult with the, why do we keep our youth separated? Why are we so intent on telling the brothers that come here, this is not a place for you to find a wife. You don't come here because some girl is here. If, our, we, if we see one of our guys circling around one of the women like, like vultures, we immediately get in his face. Listen, we don't do that here. Because of this verse... Don't, we don't let that go on here. This is, God wanted to kill them before that. Now, I want you to see what Eli does. Eli tells his kids, but you know what he does about it? Squat. Nothing. And you're going to see in the coming generations how Eli's entire generations were punished because of it. Parenting is a contact sport. (laughs) My morning devotion today said, if you love your child, you'll spank him. But if you hate him, you won't. He said, if you beat him with a rod, the Bible says, he will not die. He'll just save his soul from hell, that's all. Most people, they hear about spankings. They have this vision of their own life in their head. You guys know this, and I want this to be ingrained into you. I'll never grow weary. Spanking a child, especially the youngins, three, four, five, some two-year-olds even need a good whack. Sisters are shaking their head. Oh, yeah, my two-year-old needed it. It's not done in anger. In our house, it wasn't done with hands. It was something that most people never experienced. Because you tell, especially in the colleges today, and I get to hear all these great stories. My daughter goes to BC, and we get to hear how in her writing class they're debating the finer points of every foul, filthy thing coming down the pike from the heart of man. The new one is is pedophilia, really pedophilia. It's wonderful. Their heart, when you say something to them about spanking kids, oh, you never hit a kid. Listen to me. Maybe you never hit a kid, but my kids are spanked. They're sat down, they're explained what they've done wrong, they're told what verse in the Bible they did it wrong, they're also told in the verse of the Bible constantly, listen, the Bible says that if I don't spank you, I don't love you, and you know how much I love you. You take that child, you put her over your knee, or you make her lean over the bed, depending on how old she is, because after like 16, 17, their legs fall all the way down, it's horrible. You get that spoon, 
you give it a good wind up, <laughs> bang, you make it hurt. You don't get a little tap tap. So the kid goes, that didn't even hurt. And you'll see that happen. Uh, by the time the kid's four or five years old, you don't make that hurt, they're going to be like this. You can't hurt me anymore. They start to think that, like, are you serious? <laughs> My son was 12. He had won like seven or eight tournaments in a row. Thought he can really beat me in jujitsu. I'm like, son, I'm playing with you. We're wrestling together, and I'm letting. I'm telling you, Dad. <laughs> Every once in a while, though, you got to put it on him. <laughs> Those days are almost over, too, but. You see what happens when you don't, guys? Now, you see what Eli, um, what Samuel, the writer, wrote? He said that Eli, his kids were causing people to sin. They were causing them to have a bad experience. Now, let me explain to you how this works practically, how the application of this is. Do you know how often I hear about people who have bad experience in churches? I was gay, and I went to church, and somebody said, you can't come here if you're gay, or I, was, I, I, I went to church, and I had tattoos, and somebody said to me, uh, which one of you guys tell me about the, your tattoos? They're not here. Justin and, and, and uh, Sarah, who come here, blonde, little short, stocky dude with the blonde girlfriend. They, they're about to get married. Say, they do weddings, and the pastor walked up and said, is that a tattoo on your foot? You know, the Bible says that you do not tattoo your flesh. And I was like, I'm thinking to myself, dude, who asked you to tell this girl about her tattoos? Where are you going to get? You, what if this girl wasn't strong in the Lord? What if she wasn't church-going and God-knowing person? And she walked down and go, I ain't never going to a church again. God doesn't like tattoos. Well, I don't like you. And what the Eli's kids did is the same thing a lot of our church is doing causing people to sin against God. So look, if I sin against you, I say, I'm really sorry. You forgive this forgiveness. But who intercedes when you sin against God? And we do that. Our parents do that. Right? Our parents teach us these false things. Our ideas about God become skewed. And now we grow up. We have a whole generation that hates God. Hates God. And I, you, you guys know, you see any of the, the videos or any of that stuff that I tell you to go to that are really good. You, and you see what the comments that people make. Like, wow, you really hate God. What happened to you? And you'll find out. It wasn't God that they hated. It was they heard about some priest that molested a kid and the Pope did nothing about it. They heard about a pastor that slept with his secretary. And don't worry, it's no problem. God forgave him, so he stayed there causing people to sin against God. Are you understanding me? I want you to search your hearts. How many of you guys have, been had, that have had a bad experience? For, for, I know for a lot of white people, you went to a black church. I mean, I remember the first time I took my wife to a, I'm from New York. I grew up in a very racially mixed area. My wife grew up in Florida. There just wasn't a lot of racial mixture when she grew up. And I took her to, uh, to a Brooklyn Tabernacle, going back about, goodness, about 15 years ago. And we were online at the church. It was a big line. And, and she, she looked at me. She goes, honey, those people are staring at us. And I said, yeah, baby, I know that. She says, how come? I said, because you're white. <laughs> this is a different feeling, huh? Now you're the minority. How you feeling, baby? <laughs> Same thing with black folk. They go to a church, man. They want to find a church. And because of the abuses in so many churches, the, the big churches, I mean, you've got these big-time pastors, you know, then they go to a church and they find out that white churches are as bad as black churches. And black churches, that's what I love about our church. Ain't a white church. We have Greek people here. Johnny V. We got a lot of Greek people here. If, 
You sin against the Lord, who's going to intercede for you? You might be hurt. You might find in your heart some this confusion because your view of God is your view of your Father. Let it go. It goes right back to the first thing I said to you tonight. Listen, God loves you and He wants the best for you. And you might be under that pressure right now and it's pushing down. The Bible says if you humble yourself, He will exalt you. But He will test you. He will do just like He did. You know how good God the Father was? He brought His Son out into the desert for a time of testing. And in the desert, His Son fasted and His Son prayed. And the devil came to him and said, hey, you don't need this crap. I got a shortcut for you, buddy. I got a shortcut. You don't need to wait for God's man. You don't need to wait for God's job. You don't need to wait for God's peace. You don't need to wait for, take this pill. Here, I got a better one for you. Give this to your kid. Your kid's got ADHD. And you need to, you need to put that kid on medication. Is that you, Lord? I mean, they're doctors. They've got a, a panel of... No. Somebody... It's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom, my brothers and sisters. God loves you. And here's the worst of it. You ready? And here's where we're going to bring it to a close in a minute. You told yourself you deserved it because of something you've done. You know how many sisters I know who've had abortions and now they can't get pregnant and they say, God's punishing me because of my abortion? No, he's not. No, he's not. He doesn't do that. Some of you sisters are, well, I got divorced and that's why God's not bringing me. Or some of you brothers, man, I used to rob when I was... Stop. God doesn't do that. He doesn't hold things against you and wait for you. Now listen, you could screw yourself up for sure. But God's going to find a way around your screw-up to rescue from that anyway. That's how it works. You mess yourself up, God rescues you from the mess. That's how good and how great God loves us. My daughter, Kiki, the little four-year-old, she comes out to me a couple of Thursdays ago. And on Thursday, me and Austin are in my backyard feeding our lizards. You guys might know I have 100 lizards in my backyard. And she wants to help every week. So I want to help you, Daddy. I'm going to help you feed the lizards. Now, these lizards are big. They're four or five foot. They could hurt her. But she came out, and she wore this pink tutu with the little frills here. <laughs> she had a guitar hanging over her shoulder and a bag on her other arm. I have a picture. If you want to see the picture, you guys, it's the cutest thing you've ever seen. She comes out to the deck, and she goes, OK, I'm ready to help feed the lizards. And as a good father, I said, no, you're not. You gotta go put on shoes, you gotta go put on pants, you probably put a hat on because although white folks don't know this, even black folks sunburn, you gotta you gotta get ready. No, no, I'm I don't want Yes. You gotta get ready. And sometimes God's gotta help you get ready. God's gotta take you through some stuff to get you ready for the real work He has for you. You follow what I'm saying? God's got to teach you, but I want a husband now. You ain't ready. Yes, I am. I know I'm ready. Me and my husband want a kid now. You're not ready. How do you know? Because God hasn't given you a kid yet. What well, does that mean? Everybody who doesn't have kids isn't ready? Some people that don't have kids, God wants them to adopt. But nobody's being punished for what they've done by God. That's why I'm sick, because stop. It's a lie. I don't have enough faith. That's why I'm not receiving my healing. It's a lie. God loves you. He loves you so much, so much more than your father or mother. And here's the crazy part. He loves your kids even more than you love them. Figure that out. No way does he love my kids more than I love my kids. You guys might know, I love my kids. I would kill for my kids. God loves more. He'll kill you for your kids. <laughs> I deserve it. No, you don't. Stop. <laughs> Look at verse 26 as we continue and close. And the child 
Samuel grew in stature and in favor, both with the Lord and men. Does that sound familiar? Anybody remember that verse from anywhere? It's the same thing they said about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're going to come to see as the, as the next few chapters go by that he, Samuel, is very much a type, a picture, an outline of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's a foreshadowing to the Hebrew and Jew. Verse 27 then a man of God came to Eli and said to him. Now, it's interesting, that, term, that verbiage there, a man of God. It doesn't say who it is. And that term exists about 70 times in the Old Testament. And usually it's a prophet. So we don't know who it is. But when we get to heaven, I mean, like, who went to Eli? Where is he? That's that guy. Like, no. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your fathers all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? So the man of God goes to Eli and says, listen, you are, an, you are a descendant from Aaron because Aaron was the priestly line. He said, and he starts to go through the list of things. Didn't I give you, didn't I set you free? Didn't I do all these things? And didn't I even give you all the offerings? The people who willingly brought their gift to me, I gave them to you. What did you do with them? You let your sons profit. Verse 20, 9. You know how the numbers are really small? There it is, 29. Why do you kick at my sacrifice and offerings which I have commanded in my dwelling place and honor your sons more than me? Do you see what it says? Honor your sons more than me. Listen to me. What made Hannah so special is that she kept her promise to God and gave her kid to God. I want to ask you, how many of us here are honoring our kids more than God? Our kids are royal screw-ups and we do nothing. We do nothing about it. And people come to us and say, you know, your kid did this. Yo, it's your fault. No, my, your kid did. No, it's your fault. Listen, we're not saying your kid is condemned to hell. We're saying you need to make some changes. You don't know. That's why I left that church. That church, that's why I don't keep my kid there. Oh, my kid's been thrown out of three places. Nobody knows that. Oh, you're honoring your kid more than God. Now, as a church, especially you single moms here, we're here to help. Big brothers, big sisters. If you are having that problem disciplining, if you're having that problem social activity, please come to us. Let us help you. But never let it be said. Um, you can hear a story. We have a brother in the, in, the, in the congregation who has an aunt who is so bad that this man, I think I told this story a couple weeks ago, committed murder. Murder. He was a drug addict, a crack, and he went into a, a, a store, killed two people, robbed the store, and the mother was still at court begging. He's a good boy in his heart. He's a good boy in his heart. He's like, now you think to yourself, that'll never happen to you. Don't tell me that. You honor your kid more than God. Do you know how many people in ministry, if you've been in ministry as long as myself and Lee, Papa, uh, some of you guys, we see people they find, a, they wait for God to deliver a husband. They get their husband. They wait for God to bring them a children. And they've been in ministry 10, 12 years. They have a kid. Ministry's over. They go take that kid, sequester themselves. They, are, they run from God now. They got their kid. They got what they wanted from God. It happens even, even at our level as, listen, I was a wild cat. I couldn't keep a job to save my life. I was fired from every job for whatever reason it was. But the Lord gave me stability. He gave me responsibility. He gave me steadfastness. Now, I've been in the same job for 25 years. So much so, he's given me a little bit of success. I make a pretty good salary. Come to think of it, I really don't need to do this anymore. I don't make no money doing this. It's certainly a hassle. You people constantly bring me your promise. I don't, I gotta prepare Bible studies twice a week. I make a good living. Oh, be careful what you say. Who gave you that stability, that responsibility? Who gave you that strength? 
I will never again, well, at least I will be very careful. My wife will help me believe that. <laughs> never to worship the blessing instead of the blesser. You with me? Don't ever worship, the, don't ever think to yourself, I don't need God anymore. Oh, you got what you needed. Now you're done? Again, you honor your sons more than me, Eli, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of, the Isra of Israel, my people. Whew. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, listen to me, let me, give you, let me tell you what happened. Aaron the priest had a few sons. And God made a promise, this is so God, that the priest would always be from the line of Aaron. Eli thought he was safe because he was from the line of Aaron, not realizing God decided, you know what? I'm going to make a right turn instead of a left. He went from Aaron's, from, from Eli's great, great, great grandfather. Now he goes the other direction using one of Eli's, sorry, one of Aaron's other sons, Eleazar. All of a sudden, watch with the pronunciation against him. Far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house. That's, not, that's a spiritual arm that he's going to cut off. So that there will be no old man in your house. What he's saying is all of your future generations will die young. None of them are going to live to an old age. They want to make the offering of the Lord obnoxious to my people and you want to do nothing about it? You just curse 20 generations, pal. I hope you're happy. And you will see an enemy in my dwelling place despite all the good which God does for Israel and there shall be not an old man in your house forever. I love the way he says this. He said, despite all the good that God does for Israel. Here's the thing. You're not a package deal. God can bless your family socks off and you still won't go to heaven. God can look that whole nation of Israel and say, I am with them. The Jews are my chosen. Those are my people. And yet there's a whole group of Jews who are like the most miserable, separated from God. God says, oh, I could still bless a generation and keep it away from you. I'm, I'm like that. Don't ever think who doesn't honor me, I would this. You're not going to get a package deal. I love, when he, I love when he says that because for us it works the other way around. No matter what the body of Christ does to dishonor our Lord, God says, I can still preserve you through all that. You can, man. No matter what your generations have done, no matter what's happened in your family, no matter who you are, no matter what your bloodline says, God can still go, oh, I can bless you big time. I love that. Verse 33, but any of your men whom I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart, and all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. Now this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them, and then I'll raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do all according to what is in my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house. And he shall walk before my anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and say, please put me in one of those priestly positions that I may eat a piece of bread. Let me give me your attention, please. Here's where we close. You can close your Bible. He makes a prediction. He tells him, I'm, I'm ripping literally the priesthood from you. I'm going in the other direction. Your sons, they're both going to die in one day. That'll prove to you that I'm doing this. Now, this is somebody that's coming. Now, here's Eli, right? We looked last week, giant fat guy sitting on a chair at the door of the temple, leaning back on his back, sitting back there like this. Hey, you drunken woman. Who told you to drink? Oh, you're not drunk? Well, the blessing of the Lord be upon you. Now, this guy, his sons, wicked, foul... Giant, now again, I'm not being crass. I'm telling you, you will see this description come to pass. God even said he's a fat, he's a giant. You and your sons have made yourselves fat. He wasn't talking just fat rich. He was, they're fat people. You'll see how he dies later, why I'm illustrating this. This is an illustration that will come to pass. And he says to them, now, the man of God comes to him. This, this guy comes to him and says, hey, you, you Eli? Yeah, I got a message from God. Speak on. He says, you're a fat slob, your sons are wicked, you've done nothing but honor them above God, 
You're getting your house ripped from you. You're not going to be a priest anymore. As a matter of fact, future generations, they're not even going to live to be old men. Your enemy's going to be in your house. I mean, he goes through these things. And you know what Eli does? He jumps up, he repents, he starts dancing, he falls on his face. No. Whatever. You'll see next chapter. Whatever God's doing, he's doing. <sighs> Crazy stories, aren't they? Wait till you see where it goes. Please remember, above all things, remember Hannah. Remember her faithfulness. Remember how much God loved her. And despite all the pain that she felt, God rescued, reached down right in her pain. God's not punishing you. He loves you. He loves you. And nobody has done a, a sin here that is going to stop God from loving you. There's only one sin that God can't forgive, and that's the sin against the Holy Spirit, which nobody here has committed. Why do I say that? Because you're here. If you weren't here, then I'd say maybe you committed that sin. The sin against the Holy Spirit, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, is when God says, you need a Savior, and you go, no, I don't. That's called blasting. That's not listening to the, That's not being disobedient to God. Hey, I don't want you to look at that. I don't want you to touch that. I don't want you to do that. And you don't do it. That's not blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's called following the flesh, which all of us do to an extent, and most of us need to stop to every extent. You know what I'm saying? Please don't condemn yourself with the wicked. God loves you tremendously. More than I can express, more than you could ever experience. He's going to... I believe it. All right, let's pray. Father, if there be one person here who just needed to hear how much God loved them, may you settle that message in their heart. May you, by the power of your Holy Spirit now, may your peace, as we prayed before, wash over them. And as they leave here, God, and, and as things start to get crazy in their life, May they think about, may they draw back from what you did here tonight. And may they remember the experience of the Spirit falling upon, not, not the words of the preacher, but the words of God. The very word that was spoken from my mouth was your word, not mine, God. And may those words, as your Bible so faithfully said, never fade. And may their hunger and their heart yearn forever for the Word of God, wherever they go and wherever they are, may they remember a work that you did here tonight. Bless those, God, that love you. And those that do not love you, God, may they come to know you and the love of a Father. Thank you, God, for allowing your Spirit to dwell with us. Bring us back here, ready, willing, and able to hear your voice. In Christ Jesus, we ask it. Amen.